Okay, welcome everyone. So uh, I posted your exam scores over the weekend. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at them, take a look at them. I, again, didn't put any comments directly on your exams. So uh, you should be able to see your point values on each individual question. If you remember, each question is all worth the same. They're all worth three points. So uh, check those individual questions to find out where you might have lost points and uh, check that then with the key. So hopefully the reasons you lost points will be clear when you do that. If not, uh, go ahead and send me a note or uh, if you're in class, you can ask me in class. All right, we're gonna start talking about carbohydrates today. In making the weekly schedule, I realized that I had scheduled two weeks for additives and then I bla blazed through it in one week, which uh, was probably not the best thing. We had to skip a lot of things and go over some things very quickly. So we have uh, some extra time now that I thought we didn't have. So we'll go through carbohydrates um, and then see where we are with time. We might go back to some of those additive sl slides that we had to uh, omit and also that we had to go over, I think, probably too quickly. So um, today we're going to start just talking about structure and then we're going to get into some of the functional properties of sugars. So that is the um, plan for today. We'll see how I do with this lecture. I, I usually don't even use slides for this one because it's much easier just to draw everything on the board. But uh, we'll have to use these slides and, and do the best we can. Hopefully you can, you can follow along with drawing things. I think it is easier if we can draw them together. But. Uh, so yeah, draw them on the margins or whatever, practice. So first of all, um, carbohydrates are, are tricky, I think, because they're so similar to each other. And so carbohydrate, the name comes from uh, hydrated and carbon. So you can see the, the chemical or the atomic formula there for uh, a sugar. It's a carbon and then some amount of water associated with that. And for several sugars, that, uh, the sugars that we'll really talk about the most, the six carbon sugars, they're going to be C6H12O6, which can be translated to C6H2O6. And then um, that would be the same for Glucose, fructose, galactose, mannose, you know, the common sugars that we see in foods. We also have some five carbon sugars that are components of hemicellulose in the plant cell wall, uh, comprised of mostly arabinose and xylose. And you see their formula there. Same formula, but different sugars. So the, what makes them different is their spatial arrangement, which is called stereochemistry. So um, a common way to draw uh, sugars would be in a straight chain form. So a straight chain form like we have on the, on the screen here. And if you remember from organic chemistry, those those fat lines and the dotted lines there, the fat ones mean that those bonds are coming out of the screen into the room or out of your screen into your room. And then uh, the, the dashed lines there are going back into the screen. So there's some three-dimensional character to this straight chain drawing. 
And the way I like to imagine this is if I were standing, if I'm standing like this, I'm bending myself back like a bow. And so my head is where that aldehyde group is. It's going back into the board. And my feet are going back. That's where the methylene hydroxyl group is. And then to balance myself, I have to put my arms out like this. So all the hydroxyl groups are coming out of the screen like that. So that's kind of the, the spatial orientation that we have. And we have to do that because all of these carbons here, this one, which is carbon two, three, four, and five, all of those are chiral. I should have put a box on here. I'll, let's see, let me just go quickly to where I've got a box. So chiral is spelled like that. It's another one of those funny words that starts with a CH that sounds like just K. Let me, uh, so those four carbons are all chiral and that means that they have four different things attached to them. So if we take carbon two here, this one has an aldehyde attached at one position. At one position, it has a hydrogen attached. Down here, it has a carbon with all this other stuff. And then right here, it has a hydroxyl group. So four different things, which means that if we were to erase this hydroxyl group and put a hydrogen and then put a hydroxyl group over here, there's no way that we could rotate that to make it the same thing again. So that's kind of shown here. If we have a mirror here, if we flip all of these positions, then, you know, take that and kind of imagine in your mind trying to superimpose one on the other. And there's no way that you can do it, which means that they're different. And that's why we have to designate those you know, bonds coming out or going in of the, of the board or the plane of the screen because it matters really where, which side those are on and which position they're facing. So all three of these would be different sugars. And so we have a couple of terms here. Oh, first I just want to say, uh, usually we don't draw those fat bonds and the dotted bonds if we're talking about carbohydrates because there's a lot of uh, things that are shared among all those carbohydrates. And so if we just draw these bonds kind of as straight uh, lines like this, then the stereochemistry, this would be implied, but not drawn. So you'd have to understand that that aldehyde is still going back into the board and the methylene hydroxyl is still going back into the board. So usually they're just drawn like this. And this is called a Fischer projection, a very common way to draw these sugars in their straight chain form. Okay, but now we'll introduce these uh, terms. So number one, we have two sugars that are mirror images of each other that mirror in the middle. So both of those sugars, you can see, imagine if there's a mirror, it would be, uh, they would be mirror images of each other. And those are called enantiomers. And enantiomers are sugars, they actually share the same name. So both of these sugars are glucose, but they're different kinds of glucose. This one on the left is D-glucose, the letter D, glucose. And this one on the right is L-glucose, the letter L, glucose. The way that you determine 
whether it's D or L, is you look at the highest number chiral carbon. So remember we have four chiral carbons here. And we have, this is carbon two, three, four, five. Carbon six is not chiral because it has two hydrogens attached to it. So carbon five is the highest numbered chiral carbon. This one right here. And if the hydroxyl group is facing on the right, it's D. And if it's on the left, it's L. So you, doesn't matter how many other chiral carbons there are, you just look at the highest numbered one. If the hydroxyl group is on the right, it's D. And if it's on the left, it's L. Anyone want to tell me which one's more common in our food and nature, D or L configuration? Remember, we talked about amino acids, and I said one of them was more prevalent than the other uh, because one of them is uh, sweet and the other one is bitter. So which one is... For amino acids, which one do we have? Anyone remember? L. L amino acids are bitter. D amino acids are sweet. But the ones that we find in nature are, are L. For sugars, most of them are D. So opposite of, of uh, amino acids. There are plenty of L, I will tell you. Uh, sugars are a little uh, unique in that they don't really follow any rules, but uh, most sugars would be D, and certainly the, the carbohydrates that we eat as sugar, so sucrose, lactose, uh, glucose, fructose, all of these are D sugars or made up of D, monosaccharide. Next we have ephemers. So an ephemer is a sugar that differs only in one position. So if you look at these two, if you look at the two position here, carbon two, that's the only place where these two sugars are different. All the other positions here are the same. So ephemers don't have the same name. They actually have different names. So this one is glucose. I already said that, D-glucose. This one is mannose, D-mannose. It's D because the hydroxyl group down here is still on the right. Just carbon two has hydroxyl group in a different place. And the C2 epimer of glucose is mannose. So that's this one. We have another really common sugar, galactose, that is also an epimer of glucose. Galactose is the C4 epimer of glucose. One, two, three, Four. So if you take this sugar here, or sorry, this is two, three, four. You take this sugar here and you flip it to the other side, that's galactose. C4 epimer of glucose is galactose. So we have two important uh, distinctions here. Enantiomers are mirror, mirror images and ephemers differ in one chiral center. We can uh, have some isomerization of sugars. And we have seen this already, but probably haven't paid a lot of attention to it. But this isomerization is really important because it occurs when you heat sugars and when you put sugars in alkali. 
So this sugar, if you can recognize it, is the same one that we looked at on the previous slide, glucose. So if we were to take glucose and dissolve it in an alkaline solution, we would get this isomerization to occur. So you see that the aldehyde can move to the second position and form a ketone. And then once that happens, it can go back to a hydroxyl group. But when it goes back, see this is not chiral, right? Because you have two double bond or two bonds to an oxygen. So we've lost our chirality there. And so when this sugar goes back to a hydroxyl group, it can go back to what it was before or the hydroxyl group can be flipped to the other side. So if we take glucose and we dissolve it or expose it to an alkaline solution, we don't have glucose anymore. We have a mixture of these three sugars. So this one is glucose, this one's mannose, we saw that already, right? That's a C2 ethmer of glucose. And then this one's fructose. So if we dissolve that glucose in alkali, we're going to have a mixture of glucose, fructose, and mannose. Likewise, if we heat a sugar, like glucose, if we heat that to a high temperature, uh, you know, above boiling temperature, but if we heat it very high, or if we just melt glucose crystals so they're very hot, then we get this to occur as well. So this would be kind of the first step in caramelization. And you remember that that goes through that enediol intermediate. So that's how this aldehyde here can move to the second position and form a ketone because we get this resonance where the double bond moves here and then it moves to the second position. And this isomerization reaction is important to remember because we'll see it, um, I mean, we see it in caramelization already. Uh, and there's not a lot of alkaline foods, but there are some where this can occur. And then also, we will see it in the production of sugar alcohols, which, uh, which will make a little bit of complications when we're trying to make uh, sugar alcohols for the food industry. All right, so probably if you've seen, you know, pictures of sugars before in, you know, textbooks or handouts, typically you don't see sugars in that straight chain form that we've been drawing them. Usually they are in a ring like we see on this slide. And that's because the majority of sugars, when they're dissolved in water, are going to be in that ring form. So that hydroxyl group, actually this one right here, is going to be, um, or sorry, number five, is going to be positioned in a place where uh, it can react with the aldehyde and form a ring. So similar kind of reaction that we saw with forming lactones for flavor. So an intramolecular bond, in this case between an aldehyde and an alcohol instead of an acid and an alcohol like a lactone, but uh, very similar type of reaction. So in order to translate these, so this is, again, this is the Fisher projection, and we're going to translate it into the Hayworth projection. So in order to do that, we want to take this straight chain form and basically knock it over like we chopped down a tree. So we just want, to make, want it to fall over. And when this sugar falls over, we can then, this is that straight chain, we can then start to wrap it around just like, you know, it was kind of wrapped already, right, with 
me bending backwards like I'm a bow. So this falls over and then we start to wrap it around. When this falls over, this hydroxyl group is facing down. So we draw it in the down position here. When this falls over, this hydroxyl group is up. So we face it in the up position. This one is down and it's or to the right. This one's down here. This one is to the right, so it's down here. So any sugar here that is on the right is going to be in the down position on this Hayworth projection when it falls over. So now that we've drawn this here, we have a hydroxyl group here, but if we, if we react that hydroxyl group there, it's going to make a seven-membered ring, which is not favorable. So this is the hydroxyl group that we want to uh, look at, but it's not in the right position. This bond right here, it can rotate like this, no problem. So we can do that. So we'll rotate it up. And when we do that, we get this right here. So we've just taken this bond right here and rotate it up. So now this hydroxyl group is up here and this methylene hydroxyl group is up here. Now this hydroxyl group is in the perfect position to react with this aldehyde. So those, that pair of electrons on the oxygen is going to attack this uh, aldehyde group and form a ring, just like this. And in that process, we're going to lose water. So, um, you know, two protons and one oxygen happens to be this one that we lose. And we get uh, this sugar. And then um, you see this kind of funny bond here, squiggly line. Uh, that squiggly line uh, is there because we just made a new chiral carbon. So look here, here's this carbon. This is attached to a hydroxyl group. This is attached to an oxygen that's attached to all this stuff over here. This is attached to a carbon that's attached to this stuff up over here. And then we have one hydrogen uh, that I didn't draw there. So this is chiral. And so if we make a squiggly bond, it means it's in either position. We can draw this, this in a specific position here down or here up. So if this bond here is facing down, it's alpha. So we look at this uh, new chiral carbon and this is alpha. If it's facing down in a D sugar. So if it's, if it's a D sugar and this is facing down, then it's alpha. You can tell that these are D sugars quickly because this methylene hydroxyl is in the up position because we had to rotate this bond here because this was down. If this hydroxyl group were up for an L sugar, then we would have to rotate the bond the other way and this methylene hydroxyl group would be down. So again, but D are the most common and so alpha you can uh, usually look at that and if it's facing down there, it's alpha. And for beta, if it's facing up, is beta. Or if you look at the methylene hydroxyl and the new hydroxyl, if they're facing in the same direction, it's beta. 
this new chiral center that we just created when we reacted these two groups together is called the anomeric carbon. That new hydroxyl group is anomeric carbon. So alpha D-glucose and beta D-glucose are anomers of each other. So there's another term. We have enantiomers, epimers, and now anomers. So if they differ at that anomeric carbon, either alpha or beta, then they're anomers. We have uh, this other little term here, pyranose. So pyranose refers to a six carbon or a six membered ring sugar. So pyran is a six membered ring with an oxygen in it. And so a pyranose is, a, is the sugar form of pyran. We have also furanoses. I'll write that on the board right here. I didn't make this box big enough here. So we have, we have furanoses, which is uh, the sugar form of furan, which is a five-membered ring with an oxygen in it. So I can draw, actually, I could draw glucose as a furanose if I wanted to. All we would do is instead of reacting this one, we react, we react this one. We would have to move this bond up to react with the aldehyde. But for glucose, the furanose form is not as common. It's more common in the pyranose form. Okay, so now we can draw these in, or we know at least what a, Fier a Fisher projection is, and we know what a Hayworth projection is. Neither one of these reflect very well what the sugar actually looks like in solution. The sugar actually looks like this in solution. So this is the chair form here. This is how you would typically draw those six membered rings if you were concerned about uh, their actual uh, orientation in uh, solution. So this is typically how they would be drawn or how they would occur. But uh, you know, this is a little bit difficult to draw and it's also difficult sometimes to really see the, the orientation of these hydroxyl groups. So Hayworth projection is more common to draw these sugars, I think just because it's simpler, but they're equal to each other, these two. And they do translate exactly. So if we look at the oxygen on both of them, so this is the anomeric carbon, and right here is the anomeric carbon on this one. And so if this hydroxyl group is up, we have to draw this hydroxyl group up. And this is what up looks like on the chair form. Let me, let me see if I can get a pen here working. Okay, so I'll draw, this is where, this is the down position, and this is where the proton is. So that's what down looks like but it's up. So this one, this one is down. And so this one we also draw in the down position. This is what up looks like here. That's where the proton is. And so on. This one here is up. So we draw this one in the up position. And here's the other one, the hydrogen in the down position. So they do reflect each other perfectly, but um, Sometimes this one's a little more difficult. But I draw this one for, for one uh, reason, which is to kind of show you which one is more favorable.
So when we look at this chair form, this is a general rule, not just for carbohydrates, but for organic molecules in general. If we have a ring and we have constituents attached to that ring, if we have any large, large things, anything that's bulky, it's more favorable for those bulky groups to be in the equatorial position. So equatorial refers to these bonds that are kind of looking like they're coming out the side of this, as opposed to up and down or up above and down below these ones. So all these groups here that I've drawn in red, those are all axial. And axial is, you always want to put the small stuff in the axial position because there's a lot of uh, steric hindrance there. So you want stuff to be kind of sticking out the sides because it's more favorable. Anything bulky. And in the, in the case of sugars, the hydroxyl groups, and certainly the methylene hydroxyl group, is much larger than just a hydrogen. So we want to put as many of those in the equatorial position as possible. And that would be more stable. And you see in the case of glucose, we're still looking, all of these have been glucose. In the case of glucose, all those hydroxyl groups and the methylene hydroxyl group, everything is equatorial, which is the most energetically favorable configuration. So very stable there. And then this, this sugar here, this, this one's beta. I remember beta is the one that's up or facing the same as the methylene hydroxyl group. So beta is more stable than alpha, right? Because alpha has one hydroxyl group that's axial, this one. So beta is more stable than alpha D-glucose. And so if we look, if we take glucose and we dissolve it in water, then we can have a mixture of different uh, configurations of glucose. We could have it in the straight chain form, or we could have it in a ring form. And if it is in a ring form, it could be beta, or it could be alpha, or it could be a pyranose or a furanose. So lots of different ways that glucose can uh, configure itself once you dissolve it in water. If we look at equilibrium, which one do you think is going to be predominant? The most stable one? Which one's the most stable one? Beta. So if we look in solution, this one is going to predominate right here. And I have the percentages here. Um, so beta is going to be 60%. And we're going to have some alpha. This is going to be 38 or 39%. So 60% beta, 39% alpha, this 39, so we've got 1% left over. So all those other forms, the straight chain and then the furanose forms are all shared between that last 1%. So definitely both of these are are far more favorable in solution. This straight chain form right here, this one, 
is only about 0.001%. So those other you know, ring forms are, are still more favorable. Yet that is the form that it's reactive in. So this aldehyde right here is the reactive part of that molecule. And so when we talk about non-enzymatic browning, for instance, it starts with the aldehyde. So the sugar has to be at least some percentage in that open chain form, and that's what reacts. And so these are always opening and closing. Most of the time they're going to be closed in these rings, but sometimes they will be open, and in that moment when they're open, that's when they're going to start participating in non-enzymatic browning, for instance. So here is non-enzymatic browning. This is how we determine it. So here we have glucose again. And this time I've just not drawn the hydroxyl groups or the, the hydrogen atoms, uh, which is fine. You don't have to draw them, but they're still there. And if I mix glucose with copper, copper sulfate, but it's in the two plus position. So it's oxidized in an alkaline solution. I will end up with changing, up, changing this aldehyde to an acid. So I oxidize, the sugar is oxidized now from an aldehyde to an acid. And the copper now is in the plus one form, so it's been reduced. So this is an oxidation or a redox reaction where the aldehyde, the sugar, is oxidized to an acid and the copper is reduced to copper one. So reducing sugars like glucose get their name reducing sugars because they reduce copper. They reduce copper to copper one in this reaction. So that's how they got their name. So any sugar that is a reducing sugar means that it will reduce copper and then that also means that it's going to be able to participate in non-enzymatic browning. In order for this to happen, you have to have an aldehyde at the one position. So this has to be an aldehyde. If we look at uh, the functionality of sugars, we know I know and I'll tell you that fructose is involved also in non-enzymatic browning. Fructose browns actually more than glucose. But fructose is a ketose. Let's go back to the picture here. It's one right here. The one in the middle, that's fructose. And so this is a ketose, it does not have that aldehyde on carbon one. But we see the answer to the question I'm about to ask here. Under these conditions, remember what conditions we were talking about here? This is an alkaline solution. Do you remember the, the assay for reducing sugars? Copper in alkali. So a Ketose is still going to be a reducing sugar, even though it doesn't have an aldehyde up here, because in the assay, it's going to be converted to an aldehyde. And that's, that's good, that's okay, because functionally, these ketose sugars behave like reducing sugars. So it's still useful.
All right. So um, now let's name this thing right here. This sugar right here is important. We find it a lot in foods and we see it here in this reaction. So if we take this sugar, glucose, and we oxidize it to an acid, we oxidize the aldehyde to an acid, it becomes this sugar right here. And that sugar is, is called gluconic acid. But I'm just going to write the, um, the suffix. So um, anytime you have a sugar where you take the aldehyde and convert it to an acid, it's called an onic acid. So it could be gluconic acid, could be galactonic acid, could be manonic acid. Some of these are kind of hard to say, but uh, anytime it ends with that O-N-I-C, that means that that Carbon one has been oxidized from an acid to an, uh, or from an aldehyde to an acid. Okay, let's skip this one in the middle because it's not really that important. Uh, the one where we have, do you see down there on carbon six? That's an acid now. So if we oxidize the hydroxyl group, on carbon six all the way to an acid, then that becomes a, a uronic acid. So uronic acids are really important. We see those everywhere. So a good example is pectin. So pectin is full of galacturonic acid. So uronic acids are very important. And that would be where carbon six has been oxidized to an acid group. Uh, these are called eric acids, and they're not that important in foods anyway. Where both the carbon one and carbon six are oxidized, those are eric acids. So glucaric acid is this specific one here. But these suffixes here are important to keep straight, especially onic acid versus uronic acid. I want to be able to keep those straight. And so when we do that reducing sugar assay, we take glucose and we form gluconic acid. And that's what it looks like, that onic acid. And these, these acids here, gluconic acid in particular, is really useful in food. Oftentimes you might see on a label GDL or gluconodelta-lactone as an ingredient. So gluconodelta-lactone is, uh, is actually the ring form of this sugar. So um, if we, you know, uh, why is it so hard to go to a slide after I type on it? Okay, so these, these rings here, if this is an acid, we can still react and form a ring. It just happens to be a lactone if it's an acid. But I don't want you to worry too much about that. But I do want you to know that GDL, gluconodelta-lactone, that is an important ingredient in food. And what it does is when you put it in food, it will hydrolyze to this compound here, um, gluconic acid. So it will be an acidulant. It will acidify foods. And it has the unique functionality because it will acidify foods slowly. Because you put the lactone in and it takes some time for that lactone to hydrolyze to an acid. So you can have this slow acidification of a food over time. I suppose now, you know, we only have three minutes, so I can tell a quick story. Um, when I was an undergrad, I did an internship at a company called Roquette, which makes uh, starch 
and also starch derivatives. And one of those starch derivatives um, are, are sugar alcohols. And uh, so they were making lots of candies from sugar alcohols to try and show off you know, their products to buyers and sell more of these sugar alcohols. And um, so all I was, I was in applications, which just means that I'm making stuff like sugar-free candies and trying to make them better so they can show them off to their, their clients. And one thing that they wanted to make was uh, sugar-free cherry cordials. Are you familiar with a cherry cordial? Okay, a cherry cordial is a candy that's coated with chocolate. And then when you bite into it, it has like a liquid center with a cherry in the middle. So like the syrup will leak out as you take that bite and then you have a cherry there. And so uh, what, the way that those are normally made is that you create a fondant. Familiar with fondant? kind of like a, a frosting, a, a moldable kind of uh, candy. And um, that fondant, you take that and wrap it around a cherry, and then you coat it with chocolate. But right before you coat it with chocolate, you add an enzyme called invertase right onto that uh, fondant. And that Invertase will take the sucrose in that fondant and chop it in half to what is sucrose made of? Glucose. glucose and fructose. So it will take sucrose and chop it in half. And when that happens, you know, fondant is all sucrose crystals. So when you break that in half, all those crystals melt and then the syrup flows. But if you're using sugar alcohols, you can't do that. There's nothing to hydrolyze. There's no reaction to occur. So what we did was um, made a fondant out of starch. So like a really, really thick starch paste that was similar to a fondant, coated a cherry with it. And then right before putting the, um, the chocolate on the outside, and you put amylase in there, and the amylase will, you know, hydrolyze the starch and liquefy the center. But there was a problem, which is that in order for that reaction to occur, we had to have a lot of water there. Because remember, enzyme activity is dependent on water activity, and we couldn't Invertase is unique. It works at really low water activity. But amylase, no, it doesn't. And so we had to uh, have a lot of water there. And if we have a lot of water there, then we can get microbial growth. And so in order to prevent microbial growth, we put this sugar in right here. Gluconic acid. Actually, we put in GDL because we could put in GDL, the pH would stay high while the enzyme worked. And then by the time the enzyme was done working, then the pH would drop and then the product would, the pH would be low enough to prevent microbial growth. So a lot of like, a lot of steps there to get that to happen. But an important application of these onic acids. Okay, that is well for today. Um, we'll, Come back and start talking about this next time.